Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you are having a great day. My name is Quick, and I'm here to talk to you about some ethics. So, the NBME and NBOME have decided to add even more ethic questions to their exams. This could be either a good or a bad thing depending on where your strengths lie, but we have decided to load you up with a few questions to get you used to answering them. Unlike the medical topics that we cover, ethics questions have little to do with what you actually know. It's kind of just recall and concepts that repeat themselves pretty often in different contexts. Since these questions are different than the normal medical questions, we will not be using our traditional method of reading the last one or two lines before reading the whole question. Instead, we will be looking for an answer that fulfills the following criteria. For each question, we will ask ourselves which answer sounds the most compassionate, open-ended, and respectful. If you approach every question through that lens alone, you will probably end up getting about 80-90% to 90 of them correct, if not all of them. So let's begin with the first question. A 68-year-old male that has a past medical history remarkable for late-stage pancreatic cancer is admitted to the critical care unit. You tell him that a new monoclonal antibody therapy has just been FDA approved and appears to decrease mortality by almost 50%. The patient has a living will stating that should he become incapacitated, he would be willing to try any treatment. His sister also states that she wants him to try the therapy. Today, however, he states that he does not want to try the new therapy even with its significant mortality benefit. What is the next best step? A. Administer the therapy. B. Withhold all medications. C. Ask why he is refusing the therapy. D. Assess the patient's capacity. Or E assess the patient's competence. Now, multiple of these choices may sound pretty good, but which one sounds the most open-ended, compassionate, and respectful? And hopefully you're telling me answer choice C, right? Answer choice C says, ask why he is refusing this therapy. Now, a lot of you are probably between that and listening to the patient and withholding medication. In either case, you always start with the most open-ended response to learn more about the patient's wishes. In this case, I made it so that answer choice B says to withhold all medications. This would be inappropriate because that is not an accurate reflection of the patient's wishes in the first place. But not wanting to try a new therapy does not mean the patient wants no treatment at all. In either case, though, you always start with the most open-ended response, which is answer choice C. For the other answer choices, you cannot start a patient on a medication against his or her will to do so. That violates autonomy. So A cannot be right. We discussed why B is already wrong. You can assess for capacity, but this is most likely never the answer, unless the question clearly states that the patient is in an altered mental state. And with regards to competence, that is a strictly legal term that can only be assessed by a judge and not a physician. So the main takeaway from this type of question is that you always want to find out the patient's logic before continuing on with any action. And you're going to see this motif repeat over and over again in all ethical questions. All right, now that we have some exposure to this, let's dive into the next question. A 14-year-old unconscious boy is brought into the emergency department status post a major motor vehicle accident. His blood pressure is 70 over 40 and his heart rate is 124. You plan to transfuse the boy with packed RBCs and intravenous fluids. The boy's parents arrive at the hospital and inform you that they are Jehovah's Witnesses, who believe it is against God's will to receive blood. They demand that you do not transfuse their son. What should you do? A. Follow the parents' wishes and withhold transfusion. B. Try to resuscitate with only intravenous fluids. C. Continue with packed RBC transfusion. D call on the hospital ethics board to reach a conclusion. Now, this is a concept that you will definitely see on your exams and in your question banks. If the patient is a minor, right under 18, it does not matter the reason that the parents give, you absolutely always have to treat the patient if there is a life-threatening condition present. Acquiescing to the parents' demands is unethical and considered child abuse. So, the answer to this question would be answer choice C, continue with the packed RBC transfusion. Answer choices A and B essentially state the same thing. If you only do fluid resuscitation without transfusing RBCs, you are not taking every measure to save this patient's life. And from experience, answer choice D is 99% of the time the wrong answer. 
there is a clear-cut case where you have to intervene in order to save a minor's life. All right, let's move on to question three. A 63-year-old man with a past medical history remarkable for ongoing stage three colorectal cancer presents to your clinic. On physical exam, his heart rate is 102 beats per minute, blood pressure is 100 over 80, and temperature is 97.8 degrees Fahrenheit. He has moderate constant pain in the right upper quadrant and has been told that the previous ultrasound indicated metastasis that is now obstructing biliary flow. His oncologist gave him a prognosis of one to two years to live. You agree with the oncologist and are now trying to arrange for palliative care. The patient is amenable to life-preserving therapies. Which of the following is true about the patient? A, this patient qualifies for hospice care. B, this patient does not qualify for hospice care. C, you must follow the wishes of the patient's family. Or D, refuse to give the patient any more treatments for fear of adverse events. So if you just absolutely do not know where to begin with this type of question, you can always resort to the ultimate test-taking strategy of seeing if there are two opposite answer choices, one of them is probably going to be the right one. So let's evaluate each answer choice. A and B both have to do with the qualifications for hospice care, which I will put on your screen now. Patients eligible for hospice care must satisfy the following criteria. They must have a life expectancy of six months or less, or an inability or unwillingness to do life-supporting therapies or curative therapies. If you did not learn this, then I would highly recommend you try to keep it in your head, as this is a relatively high-yield concept for the ethics section of the exams. In this patient's case, he was given a prognosis of one to two years and is also amenable to life-preserving therapies. This would inherently make him ineligible for hospice care until prognosis decreases or he is unable or unwilling to try curative therapies. So answer choice B is looking pretty good right now. How about C and D? Well, C states that you must follow the wishes of the patient's family. When you have a conscious, capable patient, such as the one in the question, the patient's preference supersedes that of the family. As for answer choice D, which states that you should refuse to give the patient any more therapies for fear of adverse events, our jobs as physicians require us to balance the principles of autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence. Ultimately, this patient has a terminal condition to which he will succumb if not treated. In such a case, we try to make the patient as comfortable as possible even if we increase the risk of adverse events. It is ultimately up to the patient in such a case as their comfort is the top priority. So answer choice B was the right answer. So if you take anything away from that question, just remember the eligibility for hospice care relies on a prognosis of six months or fewer and an unwillingness or inability to take life-saving or curative therapies. All right, great job. Let's move on to the next question. A 16-year-old girl comes to the clinic for vaginal pruritus. On physical exam, there is a greenish discharge by the vaginal introitus. You see motile organisms on saline wet mount microscopy. She is noticeably embarrassed about the results of the exam and asks you not to tell her mother. What is the next best course of action? A. State that you must tell her mother in order to prescribe antibiotics. B. Try to convince the girl to tell her mother. C. State that you must tell the mother because you may be held legally liable. Or D. Tell her that you are legally not allowed to tell her mother. This question is trying to see if you know when it is appropriate to get parental consent for treatment of a minor's medical condition. Some of you hopefully remember the mnemonic, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex is supposed to remind you of contraception, sexually transmitted diseases, and pregnancy. Drugs is supposed to remind you of addiction or substance use. And rock and roll is supposed to remind you of emergency or a trauma situation. If the patient's condition falls under any of these categories, then the patient is able to give consent even if she is a minor, and you do not need to inform the parents. So in this case, we can rule out choices A and C because we know that you cannot tell the mother. As for answer choice B, it is not your job as a physician to have the patient tell her mother if she does not wish to. Instead, you are to treat the patient for her condition and maintain confidentiality of the doctor-patient relationship. Okay. Let's try the next question. A nine-year-old girl is brought into the clinic by her father for vaginal discomfort. She makes a little eye contact when speaking to the physician and is found to have a warty lesion around her anus on physical examination. The lesion tests positive for HPV. 
The girl states that she has not been sexually active. What is the most appropriate next step in this situation? A. Administer topical amiquimod. B. Call Child Protective Services. C. Call the patient's mother to discuss possible causes of the condition. D. Administer HPV vaccination. Or E. Administer podophyllin. So, this is a bread and butter type of question that is always asked on the exam. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, hopefully you were able to arrive at the correct answer. For this patient who is a young girl, the HPV positive lesions around a sexual orifice, like an anus or a vagina, should immediately make us think about sexual assault. Another sign of child abuse would be metaphyseal fractures and many bruises in different stages of healing. If we were talking about an infant, you would look for burn marks with sparing of the flexural creases and or retinal hemorrhages. In all of the above cases, you always want to call Child Protective Services and get the child out of immediate danger. So answer choice B, call CPS or Child Protective Services, is the most appropriate next step in the situation. Now, what I will say is that from my experience, if you are running out of time on the real exam and contacting CPS is an answer choice, it is most oftentimes the right answer. That's just been my experience, so take that with a grain of salt, but definitely think about implementing it on the real deal if you're running out of time, unfortunately. All right, let's move on to the next question. An 80-year-old woman is brought to your clinic by her son-in-law. He angrily states that she has been extremely difficult to care for. He appears frustrated about her decreased ability to care for herself the way that she used to. Over the past few years, she has had a mild decline in cognitive ability she has a mild bruising of her left upper extremity and the right lower extremity. Today she appears withdrawn and does not make eye contact with you. The son-in-law does most of the talking. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? A. Complete a mini mental status examination. B. Assess the patient's risk for depression. C. Order a CT of the head. D. Order a CTA of the head. Or E. Ask the son-in-law to leave the room so that you can talk with the patient alone. Now take a second to select your answer, then we'll talk about it. Okay, so hopefully you're confident in your choice. In this question, we have an elderly woman who is presenting with supposed cognitive decline, multiple bruises, poor eye contact, and appears withdrawn. Hopefully this reminds you a bit of the previous question we just did, as these are signs of elderly abuse. Right, Elder abuse doesn't have to be physical, it could also be due to nutritional abuse, psychiatric abuse, or neglect. Other signs that you should be looking out for are decubitus ulcers, frailty, and like this patient, pseudodementia could also develop as a result of the abuse. Just like in the case with infants and minors, you are mandated to report elder abuse. However, the first best step in ensuring that this is indeed elder abuse is to speak with the patient alone. So answer choice E is the correct answer. Okay, so just to summarize, if you suspect abuse at all, child, infant, or elder, it is imperative that you speak with the patient privately and then report to ensure their safety. If you just keep that in mind, you will definitely get those questions right come exam day. Let's move on to our last ethics question for this block. A 92-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital for recent weight loss and jaundice. She does not speak any English, but has her English-speaking family member present with her. CT scan demonstrates a large mass by the major pancreatic duct. When you enter the room to discuss these results with the patient, one of the family members approaches you outside of the patient room. He asks you not to tell the patient the results of the scan. What is the appropriate response in the situation? A. Inquire about why the family member does not want the patient to receive her results. B. Tell the family member that you are obligated to tell the patient her prognosis. C. Respect the family member's wish to withhold prognosis information from the patient. D. Call the hospital ethics panel. Or E. Have the remaining family members discuss the issue before giving the results to the patient. For some reason, this happens to be a very high-yield concept that the NBME wants you to know. You may recall that we do have a duty to tell the patient about their condition, 
but this is ethics, so let's just approach it the same way that we should be approaching all the ethics questions. Which answer sounds the most compassionate, open-ended, and respectful? Hopefully you are all saying answer choice A. Inquire about why the family member does not want the patient to hear the results. You will most likely be telling the patient the diagnosis, but you should always inquire as to why this family member is saying not to tell the patient. One of the reasons behind this is that one of the only times you wouldn't tell the patient is if the patient states he or she does not want to know the diagnosis or if stating the diagnosis will cause imminent harm to the patient. So it is a much better choice, as always, to go with the most open-ended response. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I know these questions can be a bit tricky, but just try to implement the concept of looking for the most compassionate, open-ended, and respectful answer choice, and you will do great. All right, take it easy, and I will see you soon.